Hello and welcome to BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex from BTN.com and I am here at Big Ten Media Days, football media days in downtown Chicago. We're at the Marriott Chicago downtown the Magnificent Mile for 2018 football media days. Uh, a lot of festivities going on with all 14 schools and the unofficial kickoff to the 2018 Big Ten football season. So it's been a lot of fun and I've got a couple of great uh prominent college football guests for you on this episode of the take 10 podcast and uh they're actually two of the faces of fox sports coverage of college football and one is a recurring guest we had on last year and that is lead college football analyst for fox joel clatt joel is a uh, personally one of my favorite analysts and he joined take 10 podcast the second time and sat down for about 20 minutes to break down what happened last year, the upcoming season, and uh, some random thoughts as well. So, great discussion with Joel Clatt coming right up, and we also were able to sit down with one of the best college football players ever, who also works for Fox as a studio analyst, that is Matt Leinert. He gave us about 10 minutes of his time, and it was a uh, great discussion with the former USC Trojan, Heisman winner, national champion, and a uh, thrill for me to sit down with you know a guy I grew up watching. So... Matt Leinert joined the show as well. We'll get to those discussions in just a moment. Just a reminder, you can subscribe to Take 10 Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Podbean, or YouTube. So definitely do that if you can. And uh, without further ado, we'll get to first discussion. That's with Fox lead college football analyst Joel Klatt. That discussion starts right now. All right, very pleased to be joined by a former Colorado quarterback, current lead college football analyst for Fox, now recurring guest here on the Take 10 podcast, Joel Klatt. Joel, great to have you back here. It's good to be here. I, In particular this year with this conference and these teams, um, I think that the, the balance of power is kind of shifting towards the Big Ten and, and college football. and It's good to, to be here also to start the narrative which should be being pushed everywhere, which is the fact that this is the deepest and best conference in college football this year, and its champion uh, will and deserves to be included in the college football playoff. I definitely agree with you, and uh, we'll definitely get into the meat and potatoes of the Big Ten here in a minute. But first, I got to ask, as I welcome you back to Chicago, are you relieved not to be hosting the kickoff luncheon this year like <laughs> you did last year? No, I, I actually enjoyed it. You know, I got to um, sit there and, and ask questions from the, of the coaches, and I did enjoy it. Listen. Any, anytime you get to celebrate the sport with everyone that loves the sport, I think it's a good time. So um, while my responsibilities are a little a little bit less and I can just enjoy dinner tonight, yeah, um, I did enjoy it last year. So what are you up to in the off offseason? Uh, we're you know about a month away from the season starting again, but what are you up to between the months of pretty much January and, and July? Well, I covered the draft in the spring. That was uh, a lot of fun, in particular with Fox kind of jumping into the fray and, and televising, uh, simulcasting part of the NFL draft. It was fun to watch these kids that I had covered uh, then go into that process and excel during that process. Um, and then outside of that, I love spending time with my, my family. I've got three little boys, six, four, and almost two years old, so I spend a lot of quality time with them, and I love to play golf. So... Uh, I'm able to get out on the golf course and, and compete a little bit and hack it around. All right, so how do you think the first year of the Big Ten Fox mm-hmm. partnership went? Last year was your first year on a Big Ten games outside of the championship games. So how do you think that year went? You had some huge games. Uh, Penn State, Ohio State was big. Michigan, Ohio State was huge. And then obviously the Big Ten championship was yeah. thrilling as well. How did you uh, think year one went overall? I, I, I loved it. I thought it went wonderful. I mean, the, the numbers that we were putting up um, – really showcasing these games on broadcast television were, were great. And, and some of the most watched football and college football across the entire season, any conference. So I thought it, it was a spectacular relationship um, and, and one that I continue to hope will last for a long time because um, it's, it's a unique place to go and, and be a part of. I had not been to a lot of Big Ten venues in my career because we just didn't have the conference relationship. I had not played in, in these venues. So to see the venues, to see the fan bases, to feel the fan bases, it was unique and it was very special. And it's certainly uh, uh, one of the highlights so far in my career. Do you have any personal favorites as far as stops go uh, along the way last year? Well, that I mean, you mentioned that, that Penn State-Ohio State game. That was pretty epic. You know, I mean, 
two teams that were right in the thick of things as far as the national title hunt. Great players, um, great venue, good, really good coaches, great coaches. It had everything that you want and then just an epic performance. I never thought that, you know, sometimes you get teams that lose the game or collapse or there's a GOAT, and there really wasn't a GOAT for Penn State. I know that they blew a late lead, but, I mean, it was sensational play from JT Barrett. I think he completed his last 16 passes. That was a phenomenal experience last year. And then to see, you know, the crowd on the field, um, certainly something I'll, I will not forget. Yeah, I mean, probably that and the Michigan State game cost Penn State a shot at the sure. college football playoff. I well, thought they could really, have been the best team last year. You know, That, was, that game, I know this, it's interesting to say, that game cost both of the teams a yeah. chance at the playoff because it took so much out of them they each lost the next week. Right. Um the Iowa game with the Iowa State. Iowa State yeah. Iowa goes in, you know, and beats uh, Ohio State the next week and Kinnick. So it just goes to show you that one, it's so tough to be ready week in and week out in a nine game conference schedule. Um, but it when you get those heavyweights that they trade blows to come back seven days later and be at your best is nearly impossible. Right. Um, and we saw that bite both of those teams the following weekend. So as our coverage and our partnership with Fox has kind of expanded in the last year, one thing I enjoyed uh, following was the clapback segment with fans. <laughs> For those who don't know, uh, Joel Clatt would read essentially mean tweets directed at, at you uh, yeah. on camera and, and give a response. So how did that come about? And did you – Enjoy it as much as it looked like you were enjoying it uh, on I on tried camera. to. At times I, I got a little bit too angry, and I wish it would have been more comedic than it was like vitriol. Mm-hmm. You know, cause, um, but in, in, the, in the heat of the moment, because I wouldn't read them beforehand. So those were genuine reactions. They weren't planned out. I wouldn't script anything. It was just like they would put up a tweet, and it was like, respond. Mm-hmm. Um, it came about because I've got a wonderful producer on the digital side. Her name's Kristen Scott, and... Kristen had the idea, you know, and, and, and she said, we just want you to react. And it was born out of the fact that I was sarcastic towards people on Twitter mm-hmm. sometimes. If they would send me something really negative, you know, I would send them like, hope you have a great day. And they thought it was funny. So they were like, let's try to do that in video, in a video form. And, and that's how Clapback came. This year, I'm hoping that it'll be a little bit more comedic and fun rather than, like, I got angry a couple of times. You can tell <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's not good for anybody. Right. So um, hopefully I won't call anybody a name, but we can have some fun um, at uh, people's expense that that send what I feel like are, are ridiculous tweets. And the name works perfectly because you got the, the clap back with clap your, back. your name. So, all right. Um, one thing I remember from our discussion last year was mm-hmm. you were uh, emphasizing the subjectivity of the committee and how college football is just such a subjective look sport. Look how that played out. And look how it played out. So the Big Ten got left out last year. Yeah. You can't argue with Alabama being in, I don't think, because well, yeah, they won. Well, yeah, you can, actually. Do you think? Yeah, That's absolutely. It doesn't matter who wins. Okay. Um, I think it's a ridiculous notion that you reward just the four best teams in college football. I can tell you who the four best teams in college football are right now. It doesn't mean that we should reward them at the end of the season, regardless of how it all plays mm-hmm. out. That's just, that's just ridiculous and dumb. Um, we're just, record, we're just rewarding potential and recruiting rankings at that point. Well, I don't want to reward that. I want to reward play on the field. Um, Alabama's schedule was anywhere near or remotely close enough to Ohio State's in order to compare them equally. See, the only way that you put Alabama in the playoff is if they are head and shoulders, just a non compared They're so much better than, than any of the conference champions. Right. That's not the case. The committee lied to us the previous week and said it was razor-thin margin. Then all of a sudden, without playing, Alabama jumps them. It was, it was comedic, uh, to, say, to say the least. The subjectivity of that one committee needs to either be watered down or there needs to be a restriction of the playoff to where we only include conference champions. I think one or both of those things need to happen immediately. Will it happen? Probably not. One of the reasons is is that we allow these conference commissioners and, and, and the college football playoff to behave too autonomously without some overarching governing body over the sport. Uh, that's the first thing I would fix. I know this is a long-winded answer, but the bottom line for me is that committee – well, let me put it to you this way. The BCS had the equation correct, just the number of participants wrong. Mm-hmm. Okay, What we need to do is increase the number of variables into the college football playoff committee's equation. You can't just have 13 opinions in the room because one rogue opinion or one 
um, influential voice is going to sway or influence that that vote far too drastically. The statistical variance of that variable becomes too high, just in a mathematical term. So what we need to have is either more people on the committee or more committees. All you have to do is create two more 13-person committees and then average out the three polls in Ohio State's in the playoff last year, all things being equal. Um, I firmly believe that because I think it was just a couple of rogue votes and influ in influencers on that 13-person committee. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but over half of the committee was either based in or from the South region. I mean, that, you can't have ties to that region and then put Alabama in arbitrarily over a conference champion. And just so that you know, I, this is not an Ohio State-Alabama argument. I argued for Penn State over Ohio State because I think champions should be included. Um, we need to retain the value of the conference champion, the conference championship game, the regular season, the games in the regular season. That committee told me that the Iron Bowl didn't matter and the fact that Alabama only played nine power five opponents and Ohio State played 10, um, or excuse me, 11 with the conference championship game. You know, USC played 12 power five opponents with their conference championship game. Well, now it's not even equal. Right. It's not even close to equal. The reason I'm impassioned about this is because it is flawed. The committee went rogue and did something that they were never intended to do, which was reward a team that didn't win a conference championship when they weren't clearly better. Right. Um, and, and just because they won, it doesn't mean anything to me. I don't think they win if Oklahoma is able to get into the end zone against Georgia. I think Oklahoma probably wins. So that's, like, that's neither here nor there. Um, we need to increase the number of variables in the committee process, and we need to keep the playoff just to champions. And if we do that, then we fix it um, to, to a great degree. We're, we're making the regular season more important, the conference championship games more important, and we actually fix the playoff to something that is earned and not just given based on where you're recruiting. Yeah, I do, I do agree. I think the scrutiny um, was a lot less than it should have been because Alabama bailed out the committee by winning, I think, in my opinion. And I, But did I, they? I mean, they rewarded a team for their recruiting rankings. Mm -hmm. Nothing in their resume suggested that it was better than... I was surprised it left Ohio State. I didn't think that... Nothing in their resume was State. better than USC, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad I got your opinion on that, but you don't want expansion, correct? You've no, I think expansion that. would be bad for the sport. I think that we have to retain... Um, one less playoff participant than there are number of power conferences. Because as soon as we give an automatic berth, um, what we do is we render the non-conference meaningless. If every conference is automatically in, the non-conference is totally mm -hmm. meaningless. Now you can say, well, no, because there might be some at-large teams. Well, that's a retroactive making that those few teams that you're comparing now let's go back to their non-conference and see right that's a retroactive importance rather than if you just include champions and just the four best champions of the power five group of five and possibly an 11 win notre dame now every single game's important uh, the the regular season in college football is the most important and the most unique in all of sport and we must retain that it's part of the fabric and nature of the game it's why you show up on a September 22nd at noon when your team plays said opponent right. and you know that like hey man it's it's on the line today it's on the line today um, we need to retain that and and expanding sounds great and it sounds really popular but it would hurt the sport in the long run all right, well said. Um, so we talked a lot about last season. Let's head into next season. There's five potential top 15 teams uh, entering the season for the Big Ten, Ohio State, Penn State, Wisconsin, Michigan, Michigan State, all figure to be uh, close to that top 15. How do you see this shaking out, especially in the East? Because Wisconsin, I think, is undoubtedly the favorite in the West. Yeah. Who do you think comes out of the, out of the East? And uh, who do you think the Big Ten's best team will be? Will it, will it come out of the West and Wisconsin, or will it be one of those Eastern teams? No idea. No idea. Um, I think Wisconsin has a chance. Um, this team potentially could be one of the better Wisconsin teams that we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, I think Ohio State has a, has a chance to be even more dynamic than what they've been in the past, in particular on the offensive side. We saw that when Dwayne Haskins went into the game against Michigan uh, down and, and needing to make plays, and he certainly did that. Um, I think Michigan has a chance to be the best version of Michigan under Jim Harbaugh. 
with more quality quarterback play. Defense is probably in the top three in college football. Um, Michigan State has all but basically two starters back, and they're replacing a center and a middle linebacker, and that's it, essentially. Uh, One other defensive lineman. That team won 10 games and got all that experience, and they're going to be a factor again. And then Penn State has recruited to a point and has their quarterback back where you can't discount them, in particular with their schedule and the teams that they host at home. Trace McSorley is undefeated at home as a quarterback. So you got all these factors in that just that one division. It's really hard to favor anybody. Uh, it's easy to favor Wisconsin um, in that West division. I think that they will absolutely represent that division. They've got probably one of the best offensive lines in the country, Jonathan Taylor. Uh, Alex Hornibrook was better at the end of last year than people give him credit. He was a difference maker against Michigan. He was uh, within you know a couple of snaps of the football beating Ohio State. A big long-winded answer to tell you, it is the best and deepest conference in the country. With these, this having these five teams together is is very similar to having Washington, Oklahoma, Georgia, Alabama, and Clemson all in one conference. Very similar to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to see how it all plays out. Um, the fact that Ohio State gets Michigan at home sways me a little bit towards the Buc- uh, the, the Buckeyes. Having said that, I think any one of those teams could come out of the East. All right, well, you got me fired up, Joel. Um, before I let you go, got to ask you about your fellow former Big 12 quarterback, Scott Frost. Uh, yeah. You know, I, before they even hired him in Lincoln – I remember you saying how you know he has it all. He was a home run hire if they were able to land him. So I imagine you're optimistic about his prospects at Nebraska. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you know him personally at all? I do know Scott. He's a he's a genuine person. He's a straight shooter. He's a hard worker. He's got a great background um, for for what he's he's doing right now. There was I thought he was really the prize of the off season hiring. I know people are lauding Jimbo Fisher and Chip Kelly, but but this guy I think is. I think in the long run might be considered the best hire from this offseason. Um, Scott has an air of confidence about himself uh, that he kind of exudes, and then all of a sudden that team picks up on it. You saw you, uh, uh, Central Florida play with that last year, that confidence that he brings, that toughness that he brings. Um, you saw his teams when he was a quarterback play with it. And even outside of the fact that he is a Cornhusker, you know, through and through, just his tenure at Oregon, I think, makes him perfect for the job in Nebraska because, quite frankly, Nebraska needs a guy who understands how to build a program, a preeminent program at the top of college football without a natural local recruiting base. Well, how do you do that? You go find who did it at Oregon because that's really the only other team that you can say they built a preeminent power for a decade without a natural local recruiting base. So that may be more than anything else. I mean, everything, his background, you know, the fact that he played there, all that's great, and that certainly makes it a great fit. But the fact that he saw the blueprint of how to build a great team without a natural local recruiting base, I think is going to pay more dividends than anything. You saw his personality just shining through. I mean, just in the halls today at Big Ten Media Days, yeah. you know, he's dapping up his players. He's getting along great with them. I think it's going to work out. I Very hope so. Well. I hope so. I think college football for the Big Ten for and sure. the Big Ten will be better when Nebraska is, is back to being Nebraska. All right. Uh, last question, Joel, and it's a quick one. Uh, I know you went to Wrigley Field last year. Caught a Cubs game while you were in yeah. town. Um, what's your favorite ballpark? I know you're a baseball fan yeah. and former player. What's your favorite Major League ballpark? Um, I think that the best atmosphere that I've – well, Wrigley – I mean, how can you go wrong with Wrigley? So I sat in the bleachers, had a dog, like – it was great. It was a day game against the White Sox. That was a great experience. I've also been at AT&T Park in San Francisco. That's a, That's a great experience if you love baseball to go down there. And then if you just want to go and have like one of the best hangs ever, Petco Field in really? San Diego. i got to get to Petco. I haven't been there. <laughs> it's phenomenal. So I'd love to go to Fenway or Yankee Stadium. I haven't been there yet. Um, hopefully I'll get there someday. But uh, those three, Petco, AT&T, and uh, Wrigley Field. All right, Joel. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks for coming back on the show. You bet. Looking forward to your coverage in year two of uh, the Fox Big Ten partnership. Can't and wait. Here we go. It's be a lot of fun. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. you bet. Thanks a lot to Joel for joining me. I always enjoy talking to him and uh, getting his insight because I think it's, like I said at the top, uh, some of the sharpest and then 
best insight into college football you can get, so appreciate him. And next we'll uh, talk with another former college football quarterback, and this one is a name you definitely know. It's Matt Leinert, the former USC Trojan, and we talked uh, some Big Ten football. We talked a little bit about uh, his duties at Fox and uh, just got to sit down with, sit down with him for a brief time and, and really enjoyed every minute of it. So I hope you do as well. We'll get to it right now. It is Take Ten's discussion with former USC quarterback, former NFL quarterback, Matt Liner. All right, so I'm very pleased to be joined by one of the faces of college football on Fox. If you watched uh, college football in the 2000s, you're very familiar with him. Also played six seasons in the NFL. It's Matt Liner. Hit him up on Twitter at Matt Liner QB. Matt, thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, man. Well, uh, first off, let me welcome you to Chicago. Uh, you know, you're a West Coast guy, <laughs> but uh, you're, you're in the Big Ten now. It's kind of weird to think Matt Liner covers Big Ten football, but here you are. It's uh, well, first of all, I love Chicago. I've I played. God, I feel like we played the Bears all the time when I was in Arizona. Um, a handful of times so I've always was out here I love the city it's such a great city um and now yeah it's interesting to cover the Big Ten obviously getting the Big Ten on Fox last year was huge for us um as a network and just for the for our, our fans and for us just to cover Big Ten football which has been great and to be out here now and uh it's really cool it's really exciting it's another last year was exciting it was the first year but this year I just think because the conference is so strong um, and, and there's so many good teams that it's just – it's such an exciting slate of football games that we have covering this conference. So I um, um, can't wait. It's almost here. So you're a studio guy out in L.A. Um, Do you ever think you'd get into broadcasting when you were in your playing days or uh, how'd this come about? You know, I, n- I never I never ruled it out, but I never really thought about it. Um, when I was playing, I was – Probably all the the advice I'd give to kids now is you know have a plan B and just really think about life after football because you just never know the you know you never know the the course of your career the path you're going to take. Um, so I never really thought about broadcasting. Um, and then when I kind of knew I, I played in my last year and I knew that was probably going to be it. Um, and I was still working out, but I had my mindset on just you know what it is what it is. Um, I'm ready to retire and kind of move on to the next chapter of my life. And um, I, I remember it was obviously after the season. I had a workout in the spring, or I had a I had a brief stint in Buffalo in August for a preseason game for like three days. And I came back, and that was when I knew. And I was so happy to like sleep in and just like and just I actually felt really good about the decision. And um, I took about t- I was planning on taking the rest of the year off. And I just couldn't help myself, you know, because I just sleeping in until 10, 11 and like, OK, I want to do something. I want to be productive. So that's when I kind of started figuring out maybe I'll just try TV. Um, FS1 had just launched, I think, the year before. So it was kind of a perfect fit. And I did did a couple of random shows and just to kind of get my feet wet and see if I won, see if I liked it, see if I was any good at, see if there was anything there for me. And that kind of just grew into you know, a role on some of the shows that we had there and then a role um, when when Joel Klatt, who is a mentor to me, who I think is phenomenal, kind of went from the studio to calling games, that spot opened up and, and I had kind of been doing stuff there for a year now too and they gave me an opportunity to, to fulfill the spot that I'm in now and, you know, that was, God, it was like three years ago already, four years ago and... That's when I knew it was like, God, this is awesome. This is fun. And this is going to be something I feel like I can do for a long time because I love college football. I love Fox. I love the people I work with. Um, I love my boss. I just, the, the, the feeling there is amazing and it's close to home. And, you know, my son, who's almost 12, runs around, you know, the studio and is hanging out with all our producers and hanging out with the other talent from other sports. And, like, it's a very, very much a family atmosphere. And um, it has been – so to answer the question, I never thought I would really make a career out of it, but I'm so happy that I was kind of able to transition um, transition into this so seamlessly but really love it. And uh, I'm blessed, man. Like, I love my job and, and I – like – the summer, it's nice to have. It's nice doing, you know, the profession I'm in because it's a lot 
a lot like playing where you have the fall, you're busy, 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 and then you have an off season you can enjoy. You can I coach my kid and all these things. But then once summer starts, I'm like, all right, like I just want to get back into the fall because the fall is, is the most fun I have all season. So um, it's been great, man. I've been really fortunate. Right, we've enjoyed your coverage, and like you said, it's almost here. Um, I'm glad you brought up Joel Clack because he's mm-hmm. actually the first guest on this episode. Just talked to him a couple minutes ago. Uh, I agree, he's awesome. And then uh, another guy that you work with at Fox is uh, Brady Quinn, <laughs> uh, your old nemesis in college. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, last year I talked to him at this Media Day event, and he was messing around, and he said, uh, you guys cheated in the Bush Push game. He said, and then he said, they yeah, know he it, he knows it. it. And, then, and so I tweeted that out, and you caught wind of it, and you clapped back at him on Twitter. Oh, um, was that you who did that? I, I, I pulled the quote out, and I may <laughs> have started that. So, uh, you know, that now's your chance to uh, get your you know get, get your retribution on he's, the podcast. And I love Brady, and it's funny. It's funny that, you know, we were heated rivals in college, and, um, you know, even in the NFL – weren't rivals, but then we, I remember we kind of shared, we shared the same agent for a while. So then that's how we sort of, sort of, I don't know, became friends, but sort of communicated through each other. And then, you know, and for me, it's like, yeah, I, I love, love Brady, man. And he, he signed on with Fox and we've been close. Him and his wife, Alicia, just, they just had another baby. Um, great people, great family. Brady's great. He's been, he's been killing it, man. He's done a great job for us and calling games. And, um, but the Bush push, I mean, the thing, the thing with Brady is, and he, he just can't say anything to me because he never beat me. You know, it's like, like, come on, dude. Like, three years in a row, we beat you. And I don't care, you know, Bush, push, whatever. You guys had a chance to win the game. Stop us on fourth and nine, and you win the game. Stop us on that drive, and you win the game. Don't score so fast. The, the, the drive before, you left too much time for us on the clock, and you win the game. So... He can make all the excuses. He's still bitter, but he lost, so all good. Well, I could talk for a very long time about your days at uh, USC and, and those college football days. That was when I was kind of coming up as a college football fan, but I know you're short on time, so I want to get right to yeah. uh, some Big Ten talk. Who do, you, uh, who do you like coming out of the Big Ten this year? I know um, you know it's going to be stacked up God. top, especially with the top five teams or so. Yeah, oh, it's, it's great. Just give me your general impressions of the, the conference. You know, I think – well, first of all, I think it's, it's – the toughest conference in college football, um, and by far and away, the East is the toughest division in college football. I mean, it is, like you said, it is stacked. Um, you know, all the teams, but those top four teams are just, I mean, it's a bloodbath every week. And um, I, I it, this year is interesting because when you, you read all the publications and you just kind of do all your preseason research and you're just kind of looking at teams. And I think out of the West, I think Wisconsin is – is a sleeper for me to get to the playoff this year. I think they are going to be that good. Um, I love – I think Horner Brook, I've, I've kind of – I don't say I've been tough on him, but he's a guy that I, I, I'm tough on because I really think he's got a lot of talent, and I think that team goes as far – and he's done great. I mean, God, they won – you know, beat Ohio State last year there in the playoff. Um, but I really think Wisconsin with, with Taylor and their line, and defensively they'll be fine. You know, they lost a lot of guys. But I, I'm, I'm going to – Probably we do our preseason show. I'm probably going to pick Wisconsin um, to get into the college football playoff. I just believe this could be their year. Um, so I'm going to go with them in their division. And then in the East, it, it's hard. Uh, Ohio State is just loaded again. You know, Even though they have a new quarterback, I, I just think there's so much talent on that team for them. You know, it's, it's, it's Urban Meyer's done a great job. And, and every year they come out hungry. You know, they come out hungry and hungry and um, – they would be my pick. But Michigan State is a team to keep an eye on. Michigan State, last year, uh, I, I believe they won 10 games. Last year, for them to win those games, and that was supposed to be a rebuilding year with all the freshmen and sophomores they had, and for them to come out and have one of the best defenses in the country and find a quarterback that they haven't had a quarterback like that um, in a long time, a guy that can can run the football in Lewerke, um it was uh, like, wow, this team is going to be really good. And I think they're projected to finish like fourth in the East. That's a team to keep an eye on. They have a pretty favorable schedule, I believe. And uh, they, have, they have the firepower on both sides of the ball to really make a, make a run at it. So keep an eye. Obviously, Michigan is Michigan. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the new quarterback and, and how he fits in. Uh, Penn State is going to be tough. You know, they got a lot, lot to replace on defense. And obviously Barkley is gone. That hurts them. But 
Michigan State and Ohio State, keep an eye on obviously those two teams. And I, I think Michigan State has a shot to, to win that division as well. So, All right, well said. Well, Matt, we've got to shuttle you to your next media <laughs> stop here. So Good I'll to let see you, man. Yeah. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks, Thanks a lot. On, uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, appreciate we'll it. catch up with you next yeah, year. For- Thanks a lot to Matt and Joel once again for joining me. And uh, Media Days 2018 from Chicago is a wrap. Uh, the Big Ten bus tour is coming up next. I'll be on all 14 stops at all 14 schools, hopefully talking to plenty of Big Ten football players as we get ready for the upcoming 2018 season. So it's great to see everyone uh, here in Chicago. Great to kind of get that unofficial kickoff to the season underway. And uh, we'll just keep accelerating here toward football season as that bus tour kicks off through August and into football season in September. So I can't wait. Media Days was a lot of fun. Talking to Joel and Matt was a lot of fun. Make sure you continue to subscribe and tune into the show, and we'll talk to you next time here on the Take 10 Podcast.